everybody. Hi, hi. I'm here to interrupt as usual. Um, before we get going with our dinner, welcome. I'm Dorothy Kaczynski. I'm the Bradenburg director and CEO of the Phillips Collection. And I, 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 I said hello to you earlier. And you... <laughs> Sorry, old friends. Um, anyway, thank you all for being here. I was just um, mentioning to my table mates that, at least for me, this is still like, oh my God, we're out, we're not masked, we're, um, so forgive me if I'm a little bit rusty on all of this, but how spectacular to have you all with us um, in the music room at the Phillips Collection. So welcome. <laughs> I want to celebrate and thank um, all of our supporters, our trustees who are with us tonight, my staff who make all good things happen. <laughs> our partner and organizing institutions, I think we have uh, Peabody Essex in Seattle here. Um, maybe the Met, but I don't think so. Um, but um, we, ha we, sorry? Birmingham. Birmingham, thank you. Beth Turner is here for a reason because she is the font of all knowledge. Um, um, we have directors and curators, scholars and authors. We have collectors and lenders. We have sponsors. And we have Harvey Ross. <laughs> so I'm only here, I'm only here to introduce the man. Um, and so, um, who I think is going to say a word or two or maybe more. Um, while you, you, we continue to eat, and then there's going to be a program at the end of our meal. But I just want to give my personal and professional tribute to Harvey Ross. And I wrote, you know, this is Dorothy, if she does anything, this is about the extent of it. So I, for those, uh, well, anyway, never mind. So Harvey, I thank you for your love, dedication, focus, and commitment to people. Actually, I just added that because I realized that's really what motivates you, to people, to art, to social justice, and to education. And I thank you for all you do on behalf of the Phillips Collection. And not to deviate from honoring you, Harvey, but I want to um, I want to pause and think about our beloved late friend David Driscoll. And I also want to say we're here because we're celebrating Jacob Lawrence and the Struggle series and that fabulous show that Harvey, you, and many other people that I named right now, helped to make that fabulous learning experience and museum experience possible. So everybody, please thank you for being with us. And um, I'm so glad to share this celebration with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, for those very kind words. And thank you, all of you, without whom this exhibition would not have been possible. The lenders who put the missing pieces together so that an important voice that had been mute for 60 years was finally heard. I especially like to thank the two lenders who came out of the woodwork after 60 years to share their two pieces to help complete the series. The educators and curators, without whom our understanding appreciation and engagement in this series would not have been so profound. Beth Turner, Austin Bailey, Lydia Gordon, and our own Elsa Smithgall, and there are others. 
some of whom I do not know, but you know who you are. Thank you. <laughs> the cast of hundreds, the picture hangers, the ticket takers, the administrators, and the five institutions who worked mightily in order for the show to go on. We have been living through the most challenging period of our collective existence these past two years. And yet, with all the museums in this country and all five in our venue on the tour closing during that time, we have made it from start to finish, touching the lives of tens if not hundreds of thousands of people with the spirit of this series. It started January of last year at the Peabody Essex in Salem, Massachusetts. Things seemed normal. We had opening events, lectures. It was supposed to end in April, but on March 13th, the music stopped. The next venue was the Metropolitan Museum in New York to open on June 1st. A museum that in its 150 year history had never been closed for more than two consecutive days. And yet it closed in March and it worked mightily to make sure that it would open for this exhibition in late August and it did and it had a great run until November 1st, two days before the election. I watched as thousands of people, New Yorkers, proud and determined, came out of their bunkers after six months, went to the museum and engaged in this series. So this has been an extraordinary moment and a very challenging experience all along. The, um, I am honored to be a supporter, a trustee of this noble institution. And I'm delighted by its association with Jacob Lawrence's The American Struggle, which is just the latest link in an unbroken chain of artistic and cultural involvement in the community dating back to our founding 100 years ago. At that time, Duncan Phillips established the Phillips Memorial Gallery to honor the memory of his recently departed father and brother who had succumbed to the Spanish flu. But he did not memorialize them in stone, but rather in life, as he took from his cultural upbringing, brought it to the present, built on that into the future so that today, 100 years later, we continue in that tradition with outreach to the community, and in more recent times, reaching inside ourselves as an institution to understand who we are and to bring forth our better angels. In 1942, Duncan Phillips had the vision, the wisdom, to acquire Jacob Lawrence's magisterial series Migration, the odd numbers which tell the whole story. He understood the historical and cultural importance to a marginalized people as millions of African Americans fled the rural South to come to the urban North to create a critical mass which led to a flowering of their culture, the Harlem Renaissance which went beyond Harlem to many other cities in the North, a sense of peoplehood, purpose, determination, and pushback to the Jim Crow South with the rise of civil rights in the 1940s and 50s, ultimately embracing the entire nation in the 1960s with the 64 Civil Rights Act and the 65 Voting Rights Act. And we have been the worthy stewards of this important legacy for eight decades. More recently, in the 2019 exhibition, The Warmth of Other Suns, 
we have broadened that narrative to include the unwanted, the uprooted, the refugee, the immigrant, whether they came across the North Atlantic, huddled masses yearning to breathe free in steerage, or against their will in the bowels of slave ships. In July of 1955, my mom, my sister, and I went to Ebbets Field to see the Brooklyn Dodgers play. I used to go two or three times every summer. In those days, at the end of the game, you could go behind home plate to the concourse where the clubhouse was and wait for the guys to come out, and they did. And they talked about the game, current events, they signed autographs. They did not have any bodyguards, nor did they ask for anything in return. They were of the community. And then we walked the several blocks to the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens to get our bus home. A couple of blocks from Evans Field, we stopped at a red light. And on this beautiful, bright summer day, as we stopped, a white convertible with the top down stopped beside us. I looked into the car, and there by himself was Jackie Robinson. I walked to the side of the car and said, Mr. Robinson, would you please sign my scorecard? He smiled, got out a pencil, signed the scorecard, gave it back to me. I said, thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. Got back on the sidewalk. The light changed. He waved, and we went our separate ways. A month or so later, in Mississippi, Emma Till was viciously murdered. A few months after that, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus at the beginning of the Montgomery bus strike, an event that led to the rise to prominence of Martin Luther King. What was so special about that moment that 66 years later, it is as vivid today as it was then? After all, I'd gotten autographs from other ball players. Yes, Jackie was a great ball player, but frankly, I wasn't even a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. <laughs> the the um, let me just get my senses. Uh, <laughs> no, this this ten year old kid from Brooklyn knew that Jackie was carrying a banner, not only for his people, but for all Jews as well. And so, as I think back to that moment two-thirds of a century ago, the emotional intensity remains undiminished to this day. I did not know that Jackie was heading home to the new house he had just built in North Stanford, Connecticut, and where Richard Simon and his wife, the parents of Carly Simon, a Jewish family, had housed the Robinson family during construction and had to fight their neighbors in order to break the color line. Unbeknownst to me as well, at that moment, less than three miles from Evans Field, another young African-American, just one year older than Jackie, was busy at work in his apartment. Jacob Lawrence, was painting the Struggle series. He had conceived of this series in 1949 at age 32 and did not complete it until 1956 at age 39. He spent more time, energy, and thought on this series than on any other project in his life. Much had happened since 1942. Newly married, he was recruited into the U.S. Coast Guard's first integrated ship. When he came home at the end of the war to America, nothing much had changed. 
You know the stories of the African-American veterans in full uniform walking in the South and getting beaten or worse? for having the temerity, the chutzpah, to show that they were equal in the defense of our nation. As the decade went on, Jacob Lawrence suffered a nervous breakdown and landed up at Hillside Hospital in Queens. But as the decade was coming to an end, he had a new idea about a series, one that would highlight the important contribution that African Americans had made in our nation's history. Over time, the conception evolved to a more inclusive, universal one that would focus on those who had an important role in history, but had been excised, ignored, ignored or eliminated from history, women, African Americans, Native Americans, immigrants. And so, between 1949 and 1954, he worked on conceptualizing this series. It was only in May of 1954 that for the first time, he took egg tempera and put it on gesso board to create the first panel in the series, number eight, Red Coats. It was a moment that was fraught, both personally and in our nation. May of 54 brought Brown versus Board of Education. It was also in the middle of the Army McCarthy hearings. And while Jacob Lawrence, unlike his friend and my cousin, the artist William Grappa, who had to appear before Joseph McCarthy and Roy Cohn in May of 1953, and refused to cooperate, refused to name names, took the Fifth Amendment and was blacklisted for over eight years, Jacob Lawrence did not have to submit to that witch hunt, but he knew that the magnifying glass was on him, both for his ideas and his associations. And so, between, 19, between uh, 1954, mid-54, and late 56, he spent almost all of his time and energy creating the 30 panels of the American struggle. When it was completed, the critics weighed in, and they were generally dismissive, saying, this dynamic cubism is interesting, but what is the leading African-American artist in America who had gained his reputation chronicling the life of his people? What was he doing commenting on American history? George Washington, Paul Revere, Patrick Henry. They didn't get it. What they didn't get was that Lawrence, this was a, this was a personal history, not, it was, a, it was a history of Lawrence himself, which deviated markedly from the narrative that many of us and the myths that many of us grew up on. Panel one is a good example of that. That's Patrick Henry's famous speech, give me liberty or give me death. Each of these panels has a surface interpretation and a subtext. The subtext being what I would call a subversive irony that permeates the painting. So in addition to all that, every text, every uh, panel has a text that accompanies it to give you some idea about what he was thinking. But in Patrick Henry's case, he didn't talk at all about um, give me liberty or give me death. He had another part of that speech which he referred to in the panel. Is, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? And so, especially in the mid-1950s, an interpretation of this was very much about Patrick Henry and America gaining, trying to gain its freedom, which happened within the decade, both its freedom and independence. But the subtext is very different. Patrick Henry was a slaveholder who was both tone deaf and colorblind to the fact that he viewed his slaves as mere chattel. And it wasn't 10 years for freedom, it was 90 years until the Emancipation Proclamation, and another 90 years until this panel was created, dead stab, dead, right in the middle of the rise of the modern civil rights movement. For the past two years, before and after George Floyd, People have come up to me to say, 
wow, this series is so timely, it's so relevant. And I say to myself, it's always been timely and relevant. But I think what has been happening is slowly, belatedly, people of goodwill are opening their eyes to the reality that Jacob Lawrence had experienced his whole life. So, if you think this 10-year-old kid was engaged in the civil rights movement in the mid-1950s, Think of what Jacob Lawrence was feeling at that time, a mature man at the height of his powers who had suffered the same indignities as Jackie Robinson his whole life. What he was doing with these panels was spilling his guts out on them. And all you have to do is look closely at the jagged edges, the sharp points, the knives, the daggers, the swords, the blood, the dynamic interaction, and the beauty. The beauty of the panels and the beauty of struggle itself. And so I believe a generation from now, when young people look at this series for the first time, they're going to say, wow, 85 years ago, Jacob Lawrence was thinking about the same things that are so important to us today. And I believe they will feel that way because what Lawrence has uncovered in this series is the enduring universality of the American experience forged in the crucible of conflict, buffeted by uneasy, uncomfortable compromises, the great compromise, the three-fifths compromise, stained at its very foundation by the institution of slavery, the antebellum years of Civil War, emancipation, Reconstruction, Jim Crow, civil rights, and that very slow, painstaking arc towards justice. I believe this series, past, present, and future, represents we the people in our effort to form a more perfect union. I am delighted to be surrounded by family and friends and fellow trustees, many of whom are friends and in whose capable hands the future of this institution rests. And I believe, as we enter our second hundred years, that the best is yet to come. Thank you very much. Everybody, uh, hope you've been enjoying your evening thus far. Uh, I'm Elsa Smith Gall, for those of you I haven't met. Uh, I'm senior curator at the Phillips, and I had the great pleasure of being the coordinating curator for the Jacob Lawrence American Struggle Exhibition at the Phillips. Um, but I'm just so delighted to have with us uh, for a really brief conversation um, other curators. Um, from, the, from this project, and of course also our distinguished honorary guest, Harvey Ross here. Um, but I'm going to just quickly introduce them because I don't know if you all have again had a chance to meet them and put the face with the names. So starting at the end here, uh, Beth Turner, Dr. Elizabeth Hutton Turner, <laughs> who is a university professor in the Department of Art at the University of Virginia and former senior curator here at the Phillips. So, um, wonderful to have, <laughs> yes, I was Beth's intern. That's how I got my start, but really a great mentor to me. So grateful to have, have Beth here with us. And next to Beth, Beth, we have Kate Crawford, who is the curator, uh, the Ann Barwick Curator That's of America. Oh, yep. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> the William Carey Halsey Curator of American Art at the Birmingham Museum of Art. We switched the seating up here at last minute. I can tell you. <laughs> I had to have some surprises. 
Um, and and uh, as you've heard, the Birmingham Museum was one of the, the presenters, so Kate served as the coordinating curator for their presentation. And next to Kate, we have Teresa Papanicholas, who is the Ann Barwick Curator of American Art at the Seattle Art Museum. <laughs> Harvey Ross. <laughs> Needs no further introductions, but I will say, just as another thing uh, to note that many of you may know, but Harvey was so generous in lending 15, no less than 15, of the struggle panels for the exhibition. So thank you. <laughs> and next to Harvey, we have Lydia Gordon. And Lydia is the associate curator at the Peabody Essex Museum, which was the organizing institution for this exhibition. So uh, the organizing coordinating curator. Thank you so much, Lydia. So, you know, in the short time we have, because we want, you know, to, we wanted to give you all the chance to hear a little bit from what the experiences were like for all of us along this journey. Um, this was a five venue tour, which was pretty remarkable. Um, and even predating the tour, there was a lot of time in the planning process that went into the exhibition and the publication, by the way, too. Um, which is terrific, and an accompanying publication that featured teen responses as well. But I, if you haven't gotten, is still available. And, um, uh, I wanted, so I wanted to kind of open it up to my colleagues here um, to share some kind of insight or discovery that they made um, over the course of their time working on this project. So. Um, I'm going to just give the floor over, but we're going to kind of try to give everyone a chance to, to share some thoughts. What was something that you um, found um, that was an important insight um, that you gained, Teresa? So I felt like I was really eloquent in talking about it when we kind of rehearsed this. <laughs> and now I'm trying to remember what it was. And <clears throat> so it's coming to me. So there, there were a few things. One was um, trying to install... So, so the exhibition in Seattle kind of went through a lot of different logistical changes. We had originally planned on having it in our Jacob Lawrence Gallery, which is a very intimate space and would have required a very tight hang of the paintings. But because of schedule changes and COVID and cancellations and blah, 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 we had the great good fortune of having the show in our temporary exhibition space, which is about a 10,000 square feet of space. So figuring out how to put 30 paintings plus the work of three contemporary artists and all the texts in this cavernous space was um, challenging, but it was also, you know, a real blessing because being COVID, we were able to create an exhibition that would allow for social distancing, would make people feel safe, would, um, you know, we had like really giant exhibition labels so people could, you know, because as you know, you've all seen the show, there's like a ton of text in the show um, and a lot to take in and a lot to, to, you know, digest. So we were able to, you know, really do an exhibition of the moment, um, which coincided with, of course, the cries for racial justice. And, you know, so that was the other point I was going to make was how contemporary everything felt. And I know a lot of my colleagues are going to talk about that, so I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, but the last thing I'm going to talk about is how local it felt. Because Jacob Lawrence, as many of you know, spent the last 30 years of his life in Seattle. He was a beloved professor at the University of Washington, educated generations of students. Mm -hmm. um, my old neighbor in Honolulu, where I used to live, uh, actually like came out and he said like he was my art teacher when I went to UW. <laughs> So, I mean, there were all these stories. So every time you would go into the gallery, there was somebody there who had a story or a memory of knowing Jacob Lawrence. So that's how I learned that he loved martinis. And that's how I, and I also learned that from Beth. So, um, so I am going to shut up because I've kind of gone on and hand my microphone over to Kate. Thanks, Teresa. Um, that was perfect because... Working at the Birmingham Museum of Art, 
I am always interested in connecting things to our local community. It's a regional museum. It's a museum that's a department of the city of Birmingham. And we are really invested in the city of Birmingham and representing Birmingham artists. And Lawrence, so, so important, of course, but not really of Birmingham was what I thought as somebody who's been in Birmingham for four years. Um, as it turns out, Lawrence is absolutely interwoven in the fabric of our museum. He was the third African-American artist to be acquired for the collection in 1971. Um, he followed David Driscoll with a wonderful David Driscoll painting that's hanging upstairs uh, by three months. Uh, and so from that point forward, uh, Lawrence has been a part of our museum. In 1974, we had the retrospective. And then again in 1994, we had the migration series. And I talked to so many people who had personal experiences with Lawrence in our galleries many times. People talk about uh, him picking up their kids and how important it was that Jacob Lawrence held their child um, or visiting daycares around Birmingham. And so he really felt like an icon of the Birmingham community, which was a revelation for me. Um, and simultaneous to that, it was amazing to me um, for me to realize that he's both an icon and a revelation. As many people who really knew Lawrence and um, knew his work and see him as an integral part of the Birmingham community, there's a whole generation of people who came to the museum to see the show who'd never heard of Lawrence. We had so many virtual school tours. I'm really sorry that a lot of those kids couldn't come in person. Um, and we had an incredible number of panels made by college students, um, elementary and high school students, elementary, middle, and high school students around the city of Birmingham responding to Lawrence. And people were really engaged with his work. I think you mentioned how contemporary it is. And it was amazing to me how quickly those students picked it up and were able to do something totally new with it um, that channeled what they were experiencing in a very complex year. I think we can all agree 2020 was a very complex year. Um, and so, yeah, he's, he's an icon and a revelation. Very true. I'm sorry I forgot to point out, but you're, you, I'm sure no doubt have picked up, but we have installation oh, yeah. shots running on this PowerPoint from all the venues, um, and even at the Met, even though we weren't able to get, the curators were unable to be with us this evening. So I hope you're enjoying that, uh, or have had a chance to take a look. So Icon and a Revelation, which is a good segue, um, <laughs> because... Um, uh, Jacob Lawrence uh, died in June of 2000. So he's, he, he has been departed for almost a generation, and yet he lives on. And he lives on through the power of his art. Um, and he absolutely believed in the power of art to change lives and people. He changed his life, certainly. Um, <clears throat> growing up in Harlem and being trained in the workshops of Harlem. But thinking about um, how Jacob Lawrence uh, had such great confidence in himself as an artist and in his work and in his narrative invention. And so the, think of him as a young man coming up with this idea of the same sized panels with the captions and then um, <clears throat> telling these stories that needed to be told, stories that were invisible if he hadn't revealed them through these comprehensive narrative um, paintings. So he was, he was so confident in that. And he was the power of his invention to tell uh, African-American history, to make that visible to the larger world, and then he also believed in the power of his invention to tell Amer um, the larger public of America their history. And that history looked unfamiliar. To make the familiar, the iconic stories, unfamiliar. Why? Because the images come from a perspective that had not ever been acknowledged or understood. And he did it as a thoroughgoing theorist and researcher in the American story. And I think about him 
when I think about him, I think about his clipping files. Uh, Harvey was telling you that, that Lawrence spent five, six years doing this. Um, he had amassed a clipping file of 300 clippings in preparing for this cycle. And I, of course, went searching for this and unable to find it. But what I did find were the clipping files at the Schomburg Library, the careful, meticulously compiled archival sources at the Schomburg Library. And what occurred to me was just how well trained he had been as a historian at the Schomburg and in that methodology and being able to dig down to the primary sources, to go to the voices that were on the scene at the moment in history. And his images come from those primary texts. They come from the voices, the eyewitnesses to history. And here is Jacob Lawrence showing us these familiar stories, but from unfamiliar voices and vantage points. And what a revelation. And how it is that his narrative invention unfurls like a performance. So it, it, is, it is in the hands of a master, really, that he brings this narrative art to us. And what a treasure for us to be able to learn and to be revealed and to be changed by the images that he provided. And this narrative scattered, dispersed, unrecognized until we were able to bring it together and unfurl it in Birmingham, in Seattle, in Washington, in Salem. And it ignited uh, conversations that will continue, and I know there will be something new again. <laughs> Beth is planting the seed for the next thing, always. Um, well, speaking of treasure, we also discovered two missing panels, which I feel like is a huge accomplishment of this project and the people and the, and the press and all of you and the lenders and the public awareness um, of just how important this series was and really this call to action, right? Here was the only series by Jacob Lawrence that had been dispersed, right? And we had X amount of panels. We knew, well, in Salem, we knew where 25 of them were, right? And then, of course, the pandemic hit and that, you know, that shuttered, but then it reopened. And I am still, I think we collectively all are still just in, in shock, but so grateful that this exhibition survived and, and thrived during the pandemic, right? Not a single venue. Right. It kept going. Stopped. And that is the power, really, of Jacob Lawrence's art. And to be able to participate in a project where art history is not a thing of the past, but is actively being made today in the present. And due to the fact, the visitorship of people going to actually see and making connections, we were able to not only you know, bring these paintings to light, but also reinterpret them right? As, as Beth and Harvey have so eloquently said, this narrative had been suppressed, right? And I, I was telling my table this story, like, the day that Randy Griffey and Sylvia Yount from the Met, that are coordinating curators at the Met, our esteemed colleagues, uh, called, called me on my cell phone, and Randy said, are, are you sitting down? And I said, I, I can be. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, I'm about to forward you and Beth and Austin, who um, needs to be said here, was PEM's former American art curator and organizing curator of the exhibition, now at Crystal Bridges, um, our other leg to our, to our curatorial tripod. Um, I'm going to forward you this, this email 
with an image of panel 16. We had no idea what panel 16 looked like, right? We only, we knew its title, we knew the date, and we knew the event. I will never forget that moment of like opening my email and seeing that battle and seeing that duel and seeing those colors, right? And the trickles of blood and the pointed swords. I mean, it's really, I mean, I'm being selfish, but it's really a moment that I will never forget and I think has made a really great impact on us all and hopefully all of you. So thank you. And we have two more to find. Yeah. Keep saying that. There's more to be found. We, got, we have more to find. Okay. All right, Harvey. So, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> <laughs> They're all very attractive and young and bright, and they have hands on experience with putting things on walls and all the rest of that. Uh, I have one advantage. I'm substantially older, and I actually have a pretty good memory. And so I actually remember the time when these paintings, not the paintings themselves, but the period during which the, these paintings were created. And I also remember the time, the social uh, time, and how people looked at things. So I'm not a scholar by any means, but I have been looking at some of these panels for 26 years. After a while, you keep looking at them, and sometimes they start looking different. But what is really different is to look beneath the surface. And these ladies and any number of other scholars who have contributed to the project have given me a greater understanding of the subtext, what was really going on, I think, in Jacob Lawrence's mind and his heart at the time he was painting this. So as I said, there are literal, inter literal interpretations of many of these panels, but reading all the stuff that these professionals have come up with and others, uh, I start getting a different sense of what was going on his, inside him and an understanding of the panels and the entity, all these panels together, which have a, an organic aspect to them that was not there when they were dispersed all over the place, just one here, one there, it didn't necessarily have a context or meaning that uh, we can now get a better grip on. So when I, I mentioned before that something like um, uh, Patrick Henry or the George Washington crossing the Delaware, uh, people in the mid-1950s who were critical of this uh, series, they didn't get it. They didn't get it because they, you know, you look at something enough times and eventually you don't see it anymore. You, you see it the way it's supposed to be, the way you were conditioned to see it. But now, 65 years later, with the revisionist aspect of what's going on, not in a negative sense, but in the sense of looking at it with fresh eyes 65 years later, and none of these fresh eyes were around, but I was, to think about how things were in those times, I get a better understanding of what uh, Jake Lawrence was, was thinking. And so, many of you know that uh, William Gropper was uh, my mother's first cousin, and uh, he was one of the most important social realist artists in the 1930s and 40s. He spoke truth to power. He was not afraid. He was in your face. He landed up with McCarthy. Um, he landed up in very difficult situations. He was courageous, and he was a white man. And I think of Jacob Lawrence was courageous in his own way, but while Grappa may have stuck his neck out from the 1920s through the 1950s, I think a black man in the 1950s was pretty careful about where he was going to be sticking his neck out. And so Jacob Lawrence, in his own subtle way, was talking about some of the things we've been discussing, but he was not going to do it in a very obvious, in-your-face kind of way that uh, William Grappa had done it. It's there to look at. It's there to understand. It's there to be revealed by scholarship. So this is one of the major things that has come out of this <coughs> tour and the wonderful work that all uh, colleagues here and others have done uh, to inform me much more about what uh, this legacy really is. Thank you. I think one of the distinctive features we brought 
to our presentation was the fact that we, of course, have, have this long, deep history with the migration series. Uh, and I think it was a revelation for our visitors to see this really lesser known series, but not only that, a series that showed quite a, a leap in terms of the evolution of Lawrence's style and sophistication and complexity. Uh, I think we found that visitors, you know, naturally would were able to really sort of make um, the, the chance to um, try to sort of understand with a lot of close looking to unpack um, those, those struggle panels um, in a way that was very different um, than what it took to stand in front of the migration series and, and understand the narrative in those. Um, so I think it was very revealing for us to be able to share another side. I know Walter Evans, the president of the Jacob Lawrence Foundation, came to see the show. And I know I shared this with you, Harvey, but he told me, Lawrence told him that he considered the struggle series um, to be, the, uh, for him, working at the height of his powers. And so I think that's what I mean. To, so we've all, we all love, you know, here, we all love the migration series, and I think really appreciate that. But I think to be able to bring forward this other, you know, series um, from this other moment, obviously he's only 20, 21, 22 when he's working on the migration series, so he really does mature quite a lot um, by the time that we see him jump into um, the struggle, and he's also had a lot of experiences, as as Harvey has said, um, you know, uh, in in his own in his own life. And so, um, so those are some things that I think we we found. I know my my wonderful colleagues from education are in the room, um, uh, Anne Brittingham and Erica Harper, who spent a lot of time also um, with our audiences, young and older. Um, uh, and so I'm hoping that. Uh, also that when we're going to open this up to you all to comment that they could also chime in because I know that they, they've done, done an amazing job um, and have some wonderful insights for, to share. So before we do that, um, and also we have our head of conservation here, Lily Steele, who's looked beneath the surface, did all those condition reports for us Lily. of the Struggle Series, yeah. and is an expert on the Migration Series to boot. Um, so I, I do really hope that, that you all will chime in um, when we open it up here uh, in just a moment. Um, but what I thought we would do, just take a quick second, guys. This is like a very quick second. But, you know, I think the exhibitions, I learned this from you, Beth, um, are, the, are really not the last word. They just open the door. You know, so the there's first. still so much. The first. <laughs> there's still so much more that we want to learn and, and study um, with with struggle. So, so if, you know, if, if any of you would chime in, but you know, is there a burning question that that you've had um, that's still there as a result of this project? What would that be? What more would you like to learn? What was the question? <laughs> oh, hello. My name is Karen Strickler, and I would like to know where and how you found the missing panels, please. Okay, it's a great story, featured in the New York Times. <laughs> so, no, it's, um, so there are two that surfaced while on tour, and uh, Teresa... At the Met, when they were at the Met. Right, on the Met, and Teresa in Seattle was able to feature t 28 first at, at the museum, um, so panel 16 was the first one, and it was due to the fact that the exhibition was at the Met, and a, uh, a person who lived in the Upper West Side, you know, was there looking at this exhibition and reading about, okay, there are these missing ones, seeing the work, and looking at the wall and thinking that, gee... I think my neighbor has one of these. Mm -hmm. And so this very astute person from the public went back home and uh, communicated with their neighbor that, you know, I, this, is, uh, this show is up across the park at the Met. And, uh, you know, I, is this, do you have one of these paintings? They're, look, they're looking. <laughs> they're looking for it, right? And uh, she, she convinced them to contact Sylvia and Randy um, 
our colleagues, our curatorial colleagues, and the work was in pristine condition, which is really the, there's actually, there's an image um, that was, yeah, the art handlers, this is, this is a it's, pen. It'll come up. But there's an image in this slideshow of the art handlers at the Met hanging it on the wall in the frame that the, that the owners had it in. So it had, a, it had a different frame than how we reframed all the panels for the exhibition. Um, and so, but I didn't see that painting until I actually came here to the Phillips. That was the first time I saw it in person. And then, so this news of panel 16, you know, came out and um, the, another person who lived in the neighborhood of the Upper West Side was reading her, you know, community bulletin. Not like, you know, the national newspapers or anything, but she was reading her bulletin and said, oh, like uh, a fellow person in, in, in the neighborhood, you know, had a long lost missing work of art. And she read the name, Jacob Lawrence, and said, oh, I think I have, I think I have one of those. <laughs> And so, um, so that story, um, that owner, oh, here it is. Yeah, so this is panel 16 being installed. And you can tell, you know, the frame, um, you know, is different than the, than the other frames. And it, um, I mean, it's just, it's an incredible story. But yeah, panel 28 um, was because of panel 16. And, you know, the owner pretty much marched across... <laughs> Central Park demanding to speak to somebody at the Met and finally got in touch with our colleagues there and worked with them to to join the tour and it was first debuted in Seattle. So <coughs> yes. Yes, so uh there was a charity auction um where these the original owner right, of this series, um, William Myers, had uh, put them up uh, for sale. Um, and we, but we had no paper trail of that, right? The paper trail sort of ended with the gallery sale um, to that specific owner. So it was just incredible to be able to piece more of the puzzle back together. And there are still three missing, as you may know, so... The mystery, Keep looking. the Keep haunting, looking. You're at it. still does continue. <laughs> so we have this. No, the show's been dispersed. But 16 and 28 were here. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that when the show opened in Seattle, we were all like super proud to present mm -hmm. 16 and 20 for the first time, except for the Met. And so everyone had this fantasy that we'd all be going to like antique stores and I mean, and this was like everyone, not just the people who worked at the museum, like people who came to the gallery and they're like, we're on the lookout, it's got to be in Seattle because he used to live here. So that's just how local the show felt. And yeah, so. Are there other burning questions from either up here, but how about in the audience? Erica, yay, yes, I was hoping I'd get, get my colleague to chime in, Erica. Hi, I'm Erica Harper. I work in the education here at the Phillips. So I'm asked a very teacher question. Um, and it's actually want to open it up for everybody because I just want to hear people's responses. So the struggle series was originally envisioned to be a 60 panel series like the migration series is. Partway along, Jacob Lawrence, as I was just talking with Alan about, has a hard time sort of one, getting money to make the series, but also getting anyone to buy the series after the fact. And so it was a envisioned to go up until like 1908 when we circumnavigated the globe, right, America. And so I would love to know from any of you what panel you sort of envision you would have liked to see, right? We stop at the very beginning of Westward Expansion, so there's a lot of American history that's left out of that. So I wonder if any of you have wondered or thought about what else might have Jacob Lawrence included in his struggle series had he completed 60 panels instead of 30? For everybody. <laughs> Given that thought? That's a good question. <laughs> Don't give it to me. That, that, that's probably. <laughs> I'll, make, I'll make up something. Um, <laughs> well, though, just, just, just remember that the migration series doesn't really have an ending, does it? 
and the migrants kept coming, right? And the train station, and the, you know, it still keeps going. So it made sense to me that Lawrence, when he chose to stop, stopped with um, the Conestoga wagon, you know, heading west. Uh, and s uh, this whole notion of, it's connected with that whole notion of starting over, that we're constantly starting over, and that he's quoting um, a, uh, a, a English immigrant who started a utopian community in Indiana. So it's this idea of, you know, starting over, that we're constantly reinventing. And I think Lawrence wanted to end on a note of that, even though obviously the poor oxen are sweating and bleeding and, you know, there's blood coming from under the cover of the wagon. So there's a lot of struggle to go. And, and there's still struggle to go. And there's still starting over uh, again new. So I, that's what I think. Hi, I'm Alan Lickman, maybe Harvey Ross's oldest friend, although I hate to say old. We've known each other almost 60 years since we were on the freshman track team at Brandeis University in 1963, Harvey. Do you believe that? And he looks as young now as he did then, let me tell you. And he's probably still running the 440. But, you know, I'm now a professor at American University, and I want to follow up what Beth had to say. Because I think what these paintings have done from Jacob Lawrence is even transcend the African-American experience and gone to the human experience, right? Because the human experience is always one of change, of starting over, of movement, of escape, of freedom. And it, I think it speaks to us particularly at this moment in history in the United States because unfortunately, there are those who would deny all that, who would freeze us in time and say America really stopped maybe in the 1950s and it's not moving, it's not going anywhere, it's not migrating. And everything that's done in this panel argues and mitigates against that. And it's really important that every one of us today experiences that because you know, our, our democracy, our freedom, our nation is in grave peril. I can, I can follow up on that just to say, to take exactly what you said back to what Lawrence might have painted. And I've often wondered, I mean, who knows, would he have painted historians? Because if he was pushing forward in time, he could have conceivably and planned to get to a moment when there was a, a large group of African-American historians doing this work of collecting these threads and bringing that history forward and revising that history really thinking about what black history is in the context of American history. And, you know, he's, he's looking for this, this new history. I think maybe he'd have included historians in that, really showing that active revision of America and American history that is happening now. So I... Oh. <laughs> no, I think... No, but I, I think we should. Teresa, yeah. go on. I have, I have the mic here. But yeah, I do. Um, let, me, let me just ask about the role. I've got two things. Number one, I, I also kind of focus on the Hiroshima series that Lawrence did as well, and uh, how that, well, we put that in the context of his, the sweep and arc of his, commentary about you know human the human circumstance I think it's really important as well but I also want to ask specific the role of Gwen in his life from the early stages through the continuing body of his work uh, she was his life partner and she was very influential early on and did that continue throughout the body of his work 
that's a good good comment. Are we do you want to speak to Gwen? Do you want to talk about Gwen? We should talk about that. I I uh, was lucky enough to spend time with um, Jake and Gwen, and as I know you were too. Um, and it was, uh, they were a, a very dynamic uh, duo. Um, Gwen was absolutely beautiful woman, I have to say that. Um, and she was so brilliant and she was so strong, and she was so convinced about Jake's prodigy and his talent, and she was extremely protective of him, um, I think. Uh, that's the se first sense I had of knowing, knowing them. But she was also a, a good advisor. So when it came to doing the catalog raisonne, and they, they had to sort of sort out the difference between a, a, a themed series and a narrative. I'm, get, I'm getting back to Hiroshima, don't worry, I'm getting there. Because it was considered, they considered it a narrative. And there are 10 narratives in, in uh, Lawrence's oeuvre according to the catalog raisonne and according to the deliberations of uh, Jake and Gwen and how they decided what the criteria was uh, that it was uh, had had a, it was an event something that transpired in and through time you know something that uh, they could recognize that way as opposed to a theme about a certain subject so um, th I think that sort of goes a long way to saying that he consulted her on, on everything. Um, and the only other point, um, other eyewitness I was to Gwen and Jake interacting was when I was doing the reunion of the migration series, we're preparing for it in the early 90s, and I was up in that attic kind of studio that Lawrence had in Seattle in the neighborhood near the university. Um, and he, um, I had this brilliant idea, which of course was not brilliant, but I, I had this idea that we would have a film with all the images of the migration series as one, you know, one to 60 continuous showing, and that um, Jacob Lawrence would read the captions. And so um, he starts reading the captions. And I um, uh, thought things were going pretty well. And then all of a sudden, I see Gwen sort of going like. And she sort of halted the whole thing and called Jake over there. They were talking amongst themselves. They turned to us, um, the film crew and the audio people and all that, and they said, we're not doing it. We don't like it. Um, uh, and so they said, we will, we don't like the language of the captions now. This was in the early 90s. And they changed it. And there's a whole new set of captions um, that Jake and Gwen composed together for the migration. So that, that happened before my eyes, right there. So that kind of tells you just how much he trusted her and, and how much a part of it she felt with it. Yes? Uh, I think their, their concerns were over the word Negro. They said it, it was, they had originally conceived of it as a neutral term in 1941, and they did not see it as a neutral term in 1992. And that's language. That's how language evolves, and, um, and, and he was alive to, to make that call. And that's how it happened. But I mean, they were trusted 
trusted partners of one another. And, and just one other thought I had, you said historians, that there would be a panel of historians. I went to see uh, Jake once again um, interviewing him uh, six weeks before he died. And he was making a drawing. I watched him do a drawing. And, and we said, well, what, what is this drawing going to be? And he says, well, I'm, doing my, uh, I'm going to do a new series. I'm going to do a series on universities. So I mean, say what you want about universities. I work for one now. <laughs> um, but they are, they are hope for teaching people how to think, you know? Use their minds and begin to evaluate their own circumstances, empowering individuals. Uh, and to use their minds. So I, I sort of felt inspired by that, knowing that. I'm going to let Teresa chime in before we produce her thought, and then we'll go back. Unless you had something directly related, sorry. No, I, I wanted to shift gears. So. I oh, it's not super profound, but <laughs> I, was just, I was just going back to um, the, you know, what would he paint next? And I just, I love that question because mm -hmm. it's something I've often thought about. And the one um, aspect of the struggle series that really always stands out to me and always resonates with me as somebody who studies American art and figures out how to present American art in our complicated, complicated times is how to make sure that the many voices that represent America are heard mm -hmm. within the context of American art. And I think that Jacob Lawrence was really, really keyed into that when he painted the Struggle series. So I like to imagine that had he continued on with it, he would, you know, maybe deal with like World War I and whatever. But then also, you know, think about westward expansion in terms of the communities that were displaced in westward expansion, the communities that were impacted, that were brought into the American project. I'm thinking mostly of like the Mexican communities, the Asian American communities, those who worked on the railroads, the history of labor, and really, you know, digging into that, you know, underrepresented piece of American history that forms the early 20th century leading up to World War II. So that was like what I was like dying to say. And um, anyway, I'm, I'm happy to switch gears. So let's continue. Juanita, who, I don't know how many hands there were and I'm mindful of time. So just let me make sure and get some more thoughts. I, I'm, I'm really cute, but. Since I have it. Since yeah, I have yeah, it. yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm sort of curious. We're talking about relationships and connecting points. And as Mel asked the question, it made me think about his time um, in, in Black Mountain in North Carolina, mm -hmm. which, by the way, was very close to where David Driscoll grew up. Um, and I just wonder if in the research, if anything came out in terms of how that experience might have informed the struggle or some of the work that he was doing during that time period. Yes. <laughs> um, so in 2018, we attended a um, symposium. 2017. I don't know. What is time? Um, yeah. uh, at, it was for his centennial. It was, yes, at um, Savannah College of Art and Design, the centennial. And um, there was an amazing presentation there. Um, gosh, I can't remember her name, but she was a scholar of Black Mountain College and talked about Lawrence's time and showed these incredible biographical images of him and Gwen um, in North Carolina. And... Um, uh, Beth, you you know more about this than I do. I'm trying to remember Julie's last. I know name. I can't I'm remember her last a name. Moment here. But they they she didn't did leave. Job. They didn't leave um, the the college zone, the campus. Um, and he talks. The story. The story. Yeah. The railroad car. You remember the story that the the 
for him to even go there, right. they had to hire a special car to take him. I mean, it, it just, you know, but it, it, the experiences with the Jim Crow South um, always left uh, this kind of anger and um, this determination to create um, a visual symbol that could somehow make it clear, make it clear what that was. And I think that's interesting too. And you find that reverberating in his work. Um, that red earth Georgia was beautiful and amazingly powerful piece. His time with and I think the Albers. struggle is the same thing. It's his way yes. of talking right. out about it. The color. The I mean, so we know that Albers invited Lawrence. Um, you know, they were. I mean, Albers talks about you know his immigrant experience, and Lawrence. I mean, he doesn't use those terms, but there was so many points of connections there. But in terms of the the formal aspects of their work, I mean the dedication to color and theory and creating space um, was absolutely something that they both reverberated on. Yeah, I think you said the magic of the picture plane. Yes. That's the term he was yeah. speaking of with Albers, that they shared that idea. So I think you're right. I mean, you, you know, formally, there were lots of lessons that he would have brought forward into the 50s work. Well, listen, all. I know we. I know we could go on, but I know it's been well, a really um, wonderful evening. Um, and, <laughs> and what I would like to encourage is that um, that uh, you know, as I said, the, this we really are uh, hoping that we can build on the momentum we, of all the know. amazing work. So I really want to send a huge congrats to all of the people involved in this project. Um, and our great steward and champion, Harvey Ross. Um, yeah, Harvey. Huge thank you um, for really making this reunion possible and um, really appreciate you all taking the time to celebrate with us, albeit belatedly. Uh, and I just was going to end also in thinking about, going back to really, Harvey, your thought that I've been thinking about is this idea of beauty and struggle. Um, it is a, if, it's a word that comes from Jacob Lawrence from the interview with Beth uh, in 92. And you may remember I used the phrase in the Migration Series reunion to title that show because struggle is something that I, I think we all know is so much a part of our life. But what I think Lawrence gives us hope in realizing that there still can be something beautiful, something positive that can come from struggle. And he talks about that, that there can be something that we grow and develop and, and get to a better place. Um, and I think it's really important in these times that we remember that. So here's to beauty and struggle. Here's to Jacob Lawrence, the American struggle. Yes. Here's to all of you for really being such amazing supporters and all the work you do that makes it possible uh, for us as curators um, to put on these exhibitions. So we're really grateful for all of you being with us. And um, please um, come back and see us again soon.